I was just telling the rest who joined earlier that, that uh, I'm going to go through the Maris and Queensway papers today. Uh, so get, get those papers out. Okay, so as usual, uh, I'm going to assume that you all have tried the paper. So I'm going to ask whether anyone has any questions at all. Okay, so start asking. So yes. question five. Question five of Marius. Uh, this one? Yes. Okay. So we are going to go through question five. Any more from MCQ, Marius? So question six. Six, okay. Any other questions? Question nine. Nine. Okay, any other questions? Question 15 too. 15, this one. Uh, so question 13 also. 13. Yeah, one tree. Okay. Hey, I thought you gave a trap today. Is that it? Which word? I thought you gave a trap today. Bro, I went yesterday. I'm having quite a few right now. <laughs> nice. It's not good, sir. <laughs> Yeah, you don't look good. You don't look good. Yeah. Uh, don't worry. Don't worry. You, yeah. You'll get over it. It's normal. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's so normal. The doctor said that too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, if there are no other questions for the MCQ, uh, I will just go through first the MCQ. And if there are any other questions that uh, come up along the way, just feel free to ask. Uh, don't be afraid to just unmute yourself and ask straight away uh, because I, I'm looking at two screens now. Uh, so uh, my main focus will be on the screen I'm sharing. Uh, I can't really see who's using the, the emoticon to raise hands and whatnot. Uh, so if you have any questions, just unmute yourself and ask, okay? Okay, so uh, before we begin, I just want to start. Mary's question number one uh, is not in your syllabus, okay? Zero error, zero error is not in your syllabus, just so you know. Ken? Okay, so the first question asked was question five. Let's look at question five. Okay, someone left us. Okay, so I've got a ball bearing place on X, uh, the ball moves from rest down the track and passes a point Y, which is 10 meters below. What is the speed of the ball at Y? So basically what, what we are um, going to think about is the conservation of energy, right? So over here, this fella, I'm going to assume that it is not moving, okay, yet, yet. So over here is at rest. So all the energy that it possesses over here is GPE, okay? Now, as the ball rolls down, as the ball rolls down, some GPE is going to be converted to KE, okay? As it rolls down and then it goes up, some is going to be reconverted back to GPE and some is still KE. I don't exactly know the breakdown over here, how much GPE, how much KE, I don't know. And at this point in time, I don't really care. Yeah. So the ball goes down further. So more GPE is lost, more KE is gained. And by the time it reaches this point, there is no more GPE. Okay? There is no more GPE. Um, so does that mean all the energy has been uh, destroyed. Uh, that's, of course, a no. You all know that energy cannot be destroyed, it cannot be created, it can just be converted from one form to another. So all the GPE here is now converted to KE over here. Okay, uh, Dexter, 
Welcome. Uh, we are going through the Maris paper today. So can you flip open to the Maris paper? Okay, so uh, what is the speed of the ball at Y? So uh, the theory is I'm going to use all the GPE at the top. And all that has changed to KE at the bottom. Okay. Uh, then some of you will be going, whoa, whoa, hang on. M, G, H, right? Uh, I can't find the mass. The, the mass is not given anywhere here, right? If you read carefully, the mass of the ball is not given anywhere. Uh, but that's not an issue because the formula for KE on the right-hand side of the equation is half MV squared. Yeah? And you should know, I mean, your maths teacher should have taught you that I can cancel the mass on both sides of the equation. Okay, so in this case, I don't even need to know the mass to calculate the speed. I'm going to assume that we are on Earth. So therefore, gravitational acceleration on Earth is 10. The height over here is 10. Half V square, because the M is now cancelled. Okay. Therefore, V square is 100 times 2 is 200. V is therefore the square root of 200. Uh, let's press a calculator. 200 square root. It gives me. 14.1 meters per second. So the answer is B. Okay. So whoever asked this question, I hope I've clarified it. Are there any further questions for question five? Yeah, I'm going to wait another three seconds. Uh, again, uh, if you have any questions, like I said, uh, just unmute yourself and ask, okay? Don't, don't wait for me to um, uh, ask you to raise hands through the emoticons and all that. Okay, good. So let's go on to question six. Okay, so first of all, you have to know what is Brownian motion, right? Brownian motion is the random motion of air particles, basically. So um, all the, the molecules, atoms in air uh, made up of carbon dioxide, made up of uh, carbon monoxide, oxygen, nitrogen. Uh, if uh, someone farts, then you also have methane and sulfur ammonia all in the air. So all these particles, all these, even dust particles. Huh? So all these are moving in a random uh, motion. So that's Brownian motion, okay? So the dust particles, if you are able to see dust particles on a sunny day, okay? These dust particles are moving in a random motion. Okay, there's no fixed pattern. Uh, there is no fixed speed. Um, there's no fixed arrangement to how the dust particles are. Uh, it just goes in a random motion. And this is because um, the air molecules are moving in a random motion. So when the air molecules move in a random motion, it hits the dust particles in all sorts of directions in all sorts of places. That's why the air particle, the dust particles move in such a way. Okay, simply because of random collusions with the air molecules. So why in question six cannot be C though? Why can't it be C, is it? Mm, because the dust particles themselves have some energy, right? So uh, they yes, also but like hit it against each other. And okay. like that. The dust particles, however, are solids. So uh, solid, the motion, it is actually vibrating about its fixed position. Yeah. So 
it yes, it has energy, yes, it has motion, but the motion is uh vibrating about its fixed position simply because dust is solid particles. All right. Good question. Uh any other questions? Okay, I'll take that as a no. Let's go on to the next question. Uh, question nine. Okay, so I have a ray of light striking the mirror at 40 degrees. Now this mirror is now rotated this way. Okay, uh, but the ray of light does not change direction. So the ray of light is still here. What is the angle of reflection? What is the angle of reflection? when the mirror is now rotated to this new position here, okay? Uh, so this may be a bit confusing. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm going to uh, remove this original mirror, okay? I'm, so I'm gonna remove this original mirror so that it makes it easier for all of us to see. Okay, so the original mirror is gone. Right, and I now have this mirror is in this position now. So I hope this kind of makes it easier for you to see, okay? Now they're asking about the angle of reflection. Huh? So I have to first know what is my angle of incidence. Angle of incidence, it is always between the ray and the normal. So this is the angle of incidence, okay? So they did not give me this angle. Instead, uh, they gave me, the, yes. Uh, but you said normal, right? Where's the normal? Okay, the normal is always a line perpendicular to the uh, reflective surface. So I this see, dotted okay. line that I drew is the mm. normal. Oh, okay. Okay? All right. Uh, so they did not give me the angle of incidence. Instead, they gave me uh, 15 degrees here and 40 degrees here, giving me a total of 55 degrees. Yeah? So I know since Imran asked that this is 90 degrees. And if this is 90 degrees, this is 55 this must be 35 degrees, okay? You also know that the angle of incidence in a, a ray diagram for a mirror, one of the characteristics is that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So the angle of incidence is 35 degrees, the angle of reflection is also 35 degrees. So the answer is B. Okay. Okay, no questions. Let's move on. Okay, 13. Okay, so uh, I have a student stand between two walls, clap his hands once, the speed of sound is 320. What is the time interval between the, echo, the first and the second echo? So basically, uh, when he claps, oh sorry, it's a she, it's a she. When she claps her hands, uh, the sound goes there and comes back. Okay, this is one echo. But I also have, I also have, Another sound from here, reaching this wall, and this is another echo that she would hear, okay? So I've got two echoes happening. Uh, let's say this fella takes time T1 to reach back, and this echo takes time T2 to reach back. What they are asking, what they're asking is the time interval between the first and the second echo. So therefore, they are asking 
what is the value t sorry yeah now i gotta ask which one is the bigger value t1 minus t2 or t2 minus t1 let's ask uh eugene eugene i haven't heard sure. i haven't seen you or heard you in like almost two months uh, eugene so can you zoom in a bit sorry yeah zoom in you can't see okay yeah. is this better yep okay Thank uh you. eugene t1 is greater than t2 so t1 minus t2 Excellent. So basically, the time interval they want me to find is T1 minus T2. Okay? I hope you, you know why. Huh? Okay, great. So uh, to find the time, I'm going to use the formula uh, speed equals the distance over time. Okay? So time is distance 1 over speed minus distance two over speed. The speed is the same, okay? The speed is the same. So distance one is 320. Okay, distance one is 320. Now, over here, I'm going to multiply the distance by two. I hope you realize why. Anyone don't know why, ask now. Okay, good. So the distance, remember wait, wait, wait. to, so, yes. Uh, why again? Okay, because the sound travels 320 meters and it's got to travel back another 320 meters to reach her, for her to hear that echo. All right. So the actual distance traveled by the sound is 320 there and 320 back. So I have to multiply by two. It has to travel 160 for T2 back and forth again, right? Yes. So, so that one uh, times two. Okay, right. what's the speed? Uh? So this is 320 minus, you are right, 160 times 2 over 320. Okay, uh, you press your calculator. Uh, 1, two. Is it 1? One? 1 second, yeah. is it? Okay, yeah. thank you. So you get one, oops. So you get one second. Okay, the answer is B. All right. Okay, no one's asking question. Okay, then let's move on. Question fifteen. Which oh, one? Sir, sir, sir. I don't need fifteen anymore. Yes. I, I huh? don't need fifteen. I don't okay. need fifteen anymore. Yeah. Okay, great. Then let's move on. Uh, that's it for MCQ. Unless anyone has any other question, I'll I'll give you about ten seconds to look through and ask. Uh, sir, number seventeen. 17, huh? Yeah. Okay, 17. Okay, 17. Uh, I have current flowing here. All right. A1 and A2 are the readings, and V1, V2 are the voltmeter. These two are the ammeter. Which one of the following describes? Which one of the following describes correctly the ammeter and voltmeter readings? Now, ammeter tells me the current. Okay, ammeter tells me the current. So I know the current, the current flowing from over here, going through, going through, going through, going through, going through, going through, going through will not change. Because current in a series circuit stays the same. 
current does not change. So therefore, A1 and A2 must be the same. So A1 is equal to A2, A1 is equal to A2, okay? Option A and B is wrong already. So I can eliminate, eliminate option A and B. Next, now let's look at the voltage. Now, this fella has got a, a smaller resistor. This fella has got a bigger resistor, okay? Smaller resistor will need lesser energy to cross. Make sense? A small resistor needs lesser energy to cross, okay? And you know, voltage is a form of energy. Okay, volts is a form of energy. Therefore, smaller resistor in a series, I'm talking about series circuit, huh? smaller resistor will need smaller voltage. Okay, whereas this fella, bigger resistor will need bigger voltage. Right? So I need to look for V2 bigger than V1, uh, or V1 is less than V2. Answer is C. Got it, Imran? Okay. Okay. Uh, any it, other MC? It feels so weird now to write. So. <laughs> like my hand is like really weird and numb. Oh, you got the jab on your right hand. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> should have gotten it on your non-writing hand. Yeah, <laughs> but the chair position was like, then I was like, nah, I don't want to bring any awkward okay. conversation. So I just got it on my right. Okay, it's yeah. all good. Hopefully, hopefully. Okay. If there are no other questions for the MCQ, uh, I can't help you with question 21 to 40. That's chemistry. Let's go to paper two now, okay? Okay, paper two. Any questions, paper two? Start asking. Uh, question three, sir. Three, okay. Oh, question three is an interesting question. Okay, question three. And Any six. more? Six. Any others? No, that's it for me. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Imran. Anyone else? No? Okay. Then let's just go through these questions first. And if there are any others that come up along the way, you can ask us. Huh? Okay. So uh, I have a man standing uh, one end of the plank. Uh, the plank is pivoted at X, so this is where the pivot is. Uh, the plank has a mass of 20 kg. It is 2.5 meters long with a uniform cross section. Now, each of this uh, tells me something. 20 kg gives me an information I need. 2.5 meters gives me an information I need. Uniform cross-sectional area also gives me a, a information I need. So let's break it down here, okay? The plank has a mass of 20 kg. This means that I know the weight is 200 Newton. So this is the information that I can gather from this. It is 2.5 meters long. If I know that it is 2.5 meters long, 
the center, the center of the plank is going to be one point two five. Yeah, it's going to be one point two five meters from the end. Okay, okay. So this is what it means. The third piece of information, cross-sectional area. Cross-sectional area means, uh, sorry, a uniform cross-sectional area means the center of gravity, the CG, is in the center. Okay, so that's what it means. So I've identified the center of the plank, and now I can draw the line of action of the weight of the plank. In this case, the weight is 200 Newton. So the weight, there is a downward force of 200 Newton here. So all the information I get from the first sentence. All right. So let's carry on reading. Okay, one end is pivoted uh, 0.5 meters. A load is placed on the other end to balance the plank. So I've got another load over here. Okay, let's call this L. I don't know what uh, is the quantity of L. I'll just call it L. Uh, A1, calculate the anti-clockwise moment due to the weight of the plank. So one, anti-clockwise moment. So first of all, you gotta uh, know what the formula for moment is. So moment is force times the perpendicular distance, okay? So the force is the downward force of the weight. Remember, they're just asking for the weight. Nothing else, just the weight. So the weight is 200 Newton times the perpendicular distance to the pivot. Okay, this is important to the pivot. So what I'm looking for is this distance. Yeah, this is the distance that I'm looking for. So if I know this is 1.25, this is 0.5. I can therefore find this distance. 0.757. Exactly. It's just 1.25 minus uh, 0.5. Zero, so it's yeah, 0.75. So you press your calculator. What will I get? 150. So. Thank you. 150 Newton meter. Okay. Part two, using the principle of moments, determine the weight of the load to balance it. All right, so now, let's use a different color for part two. So uh, you have to write down due to principle of moments, sum of anti-clockwise moment equals sum <clears throat> of clockwise moment. So this is some sort of like your uh, equation, okay? Okay. Now I have got two anti-clockwise moment. I've got one anti-clockwise moment and two anti-clockwise moment. Okay. And these two anti-clockwise moments are balanced by one clockwise moment. Okay. So Sum of anti-clockwise moment, I've got L times distance to the pivot, times distance to the pivot. So if this is 
1.25 meters, I have to add another 0 0.75, okay? Which gives me two meters, two meters, okay? I have to add this one anticlockwise moment. I have to add it to the next anticlockwise moment. So this is 200. Actually, I don't have to uh, write the working again. I've already calculated it here. So I can just put it in here, 150, okay? And this equals to the man. Uh, okay, they didn't say, how heavy is the man? Uh, they did, so it's 60, 60 kg, yeah. So, but I, I'm not gonna use 60 kg, right? I have to change this to a force. <clears throat> I'm going to assume that we are on Earth. 600, right? Yeah, so it's 600 Newton. So it's 600 Newton multiplied by 0 0.5 over here. Okay, so L, this is where you have to be proficient in your maths. So this is uh, 300, so 300. 2L, because L times 2. Uh, why L times 2? The, uh, is you, you wrote L times 2 meter plus 150. So isn't oh, it yeah, 2L? Yeah, yeah uh, but I'm, I'm going to do the maths now. Oh, okay, okay. Right. Yeah, so it's... 600 times 0.5 is 300, 300 minus 150 is 150, 150 divided by two is 75, uh, sorry, 75 Newton. So it's 75 Newton, okay? So I hope uh, I've, how I've explained it kind of lets you see my train of thought when I'm doing these sort of questions. Yeah. Okay, before I go on to the next question, uh, any other questions? No? Okay, let's look at B. Why does the load touch the ground when the man walks towards X? So when this fella, when this man walks towards X, the load is going to touch the ground, okay? So uh, before I write it, uh, let me uh, say out loud my thoughts. So when this fella starts walking towards X, uh, the distance between the man and the pivot decreases. When this distance decreases, the clockwise moment decreases. You'll notice that the anti-clockwise moment doesn't change. So now the anti-clockwise moment is going to be greater than the clockwise moment. And if the anti-clockwise moment is greater, this beam is going to rotate in an anti-clockwise moment. Okay, so those are the thought processes going on in my head. Yeah. So let's put all that down in words. So first of all, I have to state that uh, when walking towards X, the clockwise moment decreases. Okay, so that's the first point that I would want to make. Yeah. Now, I also have to state, I also have to state that the anti clockwise moment does not 
change. Okay, so if clockwise decreases, anti-clockwise does not change. Therefore, the anti-clockwise moment is now greater than the clockwise moment. Okay. And since the anti-clockwise moment is now greater, therefore, um, so yes. I don't understand the, sec the first and second point. Uh, As why in the, the, clock, the clockwise moment decreases and why doesn't the anti-clockwise moment change? I mean, it does okay. not change. Okay. So you're not sure why the clockwise moment decreases, huh? Yeah. So let's go back here now. Clockwise moment. Uh, they say pink is the new black, right? So uh, I'm only going to look at the clockwise moment. All right. Only the clockwise moment. So only due to this guy. Clockwise moment, the clockwise moment is the weight, which is 600 times the distance, 0 0.5. When he starts walking towards x, 600 doesn't change, right? Because his mass doesn't change. But the distance gets smaller. Okay, so maybe you can even drop down to maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.2. Uh, they didn't say. But I do know that this distance is going to be smaller. So a smaller number multiplied by 600 is going to give me a smaller clockwise moment. Get it, Imran? So the first thing is I know this clockwise moment will decrease. So it's going to get smaller. Has the weight of the plank changed? No, it doesn't. Has the, the force of the load changed? It also hasn't. The distance from the weight to the pivot is the same. The distance from the load to the pivot is also the same. So everything else on the left-hand side of the pivot does not change. It's all the same. So if everything else on the left-hand side doesn't change, it means that the anti-clockwise moment is constant since everything else over here doesn't change. Okay? So with that in mind, the clockwise moment decreases. I've got to state that. Anti-clockwise moment stays constant or does not change, all right? Okay, so now, since the anti-clockwise moment is greater, the plank, therefore, plank rotates. Anti-clockwise. And the load thus touches the ground. Okay. Okay, there's no part C. Okay. Any questions? No, okay, good. Let's go on to six, okay? Okay, so this shows the path of a ray of light as it passes through a glass prism. 
Using angles from 6.1, calculate the refractive index of the glass. Okay, so refractive index is N. Yeah, and N has three formulas. So I'll, I'll write down all three here as a, some sort of like a revision. So N equals the sine I over sine R. You must also bear in mind that this angle I is the one in air or vacuum. And this angle R is the angle in the medium. Okay. Next, N is C over V. What is C over V? C is the speed of light yeah. in air. Is the medium right there. And this is the speed in the medium. Okay. And there's also, of course, a third formula. N is one over sine C. This capital C is your critical angle. All right, so these are the three formulas that you must know uh, whenever you're talking about uh, refraction. Okay, uh, so in this case, in this case, I'm going to use the first formula. Okay, they didn't give me the critical angle, neither did they give me uh, the speed of light in, in the glass. So uh, the only option I have is to work with all the angles, yeah? So n equals to sine i over sine r. i is the angle in air. So this is the angle that I want here, 45. So it's sine 45 degrees over sine. And this is the angle of refraction right, 29 degrees. Okay, you press your calculator. Um, you should get... 1.458, so. Okay, so that's 1.46. So there is no uh, units for... Ref refractive index. So you just leave it as 1.46, okay? Yep. Okay, next, calculate the critical angle. Okay, so now I'm gonna use this formula. So what's the critical angle again? I can't remember the definition. Okay, the, okay, the critical angle is the angle whereby the angle of ref, refraction is 90 degrees. Exactly so, 90 degrees. Yeah, so let me draw okay. it for you. If this is the medium, this is the ray. Uh, I, I don't know what medium this is. Let's call it medium X. And if this is my normal, the critical angle is over here. So the critical angle is the angle of incidence such that the angle of reflection is 90 degrees. Okay, this is what it means by critical angle. Is the angle of incidence such that the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. So now let's come back to the formula. We found N in a previous part, 1.46. So this is 
So then for n, do we use the, uh, the rounder value or the original value? Uh, you can use 1.46. Oh, okay. So C is sine inverse of one over 1.46. Press your calculator and you should get 43 degrees, right? So, yeah, you don't yes. need to run off the 3 SF. Oh, what, what is the number? Uh, I got 43.3. 43.3, 43. 43. is it? Okay. 43.23, so. So 3 SF. Wait, so I got 43.28. So I run out of 43.3. Yeah. So should you follow the raw value or the 1.46? I would use 1.46. Yeah. Because I'm taking my answer from part A. But so I'm... But your part A answer is actually uh one point four five eight five. Yeah. So you should follow the uh, round off value. Yes. Just follow the round off value. Okay. Any other questions? Good questions, all. Okay, if there are no questions, uh, let's go on to part C. Uh. So at, at B, it does not emerge. It does not emerge at B. So you would expect the ray of light here to refract outwards, right? Uh, but it doesn't. So let's find out why. I'm going to zoom in more. Okay, so over here, I can calculate what this angle is. Okay, I can calculate what this angle is. Because I know that internal angles of a right angle, uh, sorry, in any triangle is 180 degrees. Yeah, this is 90, this is 29. So the angle is 180 minus 90 minus 29. This gives me 61 degrees. So this is 61 degrees over here, All right? So what happens now is that the angle of incidence here, 61 degrees, the angle at B, uh, the angle of incidence is greater than the angle of critical angle, okay? Now, this, this is special. When this happens, total internal reflection takes place. So when this happens, total internal reflection will take place, okay? So let's write down the answer. At B, angle of incidence is 61 degrees, okay? This is greater than the critical angle of 43.2 degrees, okay? This is just one condition for total internal reflection to occur. I also have to write down the second condition. The ray is traveling from an optically denser medium 
to a less dense medium. Okay, so I have to write down these two conditions in order to explain total internal reflection. Total internal reflection will only take place when these two conditions are present. Okay, so after I've written this down, I can therefore say, therefore, total internal reflection occurs. And sorry. at B, okay? So keywords, angle of incidence, greater than critical angle. Traveling from optically denser medium to less dense medium. Total internal reflection occurs. So these are the keywords that you must have in your answers uh, for part C, okay? Okay, so it's, um, it's been one hour. I'm gonna give everyone a five minute break. Uh, you can go to the toilet, have a cup of water. Uh, it's, 10.30, I will start again at 10.35. So in the meantime, also look through which other questions you need help with in um, Maris. Or if we are done with Maris, you can just go straight to Queensway. So I can go through question nine. Sure. Let me circle it first. Huh? Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll see you guys back at 10.35, all right? Okay, so uh, before the break, someone asked about uh, explaining how a circuit breaker works, all right? So uh, what, okay, so let me explain uh, how a circuit breaker works first, right? Uh, so what's happening is that I've got two terminals, right? Terminal one, terminal two. Uh, what's going to happen is that the current is going to go into terminal one. Okay, the current is going to go into terminal one. The current is going to come here. Current is going to come here. This is the contact, right? So because these two are touching, because these two are touching, current is going to come here, okay? And the current is going to come here. So I'm just tracing the flow of the current. So current is gonna flow, 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 and down and out to terminal two. So I don't know where this goes, uh, probably somewhere uh, in the house or wherever it is, okay? So this is how it works normally, normally. So when the current flows normally, uh, yes, the iron core is going to be magnetized. However, it is tuned in such a way that it is going to be a weak magnet. Okay, it's going to be a weak magnet. However, due to whatever circumstances, there is a, a damage to some wires, there's a short circuit somewhere, there's overloading of your appliances at home, whatever the situation is, maybe, uh, there's a thunderstorm, lightning strikes, whatever it is. Uh, huge current now flows, okay? So now there's a big current flowing. So this big current will come, follow the same path. Now, the big current passing through the solenoid is going to make this iron core now a very strong magnet. Because you know that one way to increase the strength of the electromagnet, one way is to increase the current flowing through the solenoid. Another way is, of course, uh, putting in more turns per unit length in the solenoid. 
Okay, so when this iron core becomes a very strong electromagnet, this iron armature is going to be attracted to the magnet, it's iron. So this fella now is going to be pivoted to the right, okay? And when this pivots to the right, this springy metal is going to break contact and it's going to come here. So now the current has no way of reaching terminal two because the contact here is broken, okay? So this is essentially how it works. Before I go on to the actual question itself, uh, any doubts, any queries? And so what's the point of this? The, oh, as in what's the point of a circuit breaker? Yeah, like you just put the thing away then. Yeah, so when this iron armature is pulled away, the contact here is broken, right? So when a contact is broken, it's now an open circuit. So basically, if I draw a circuit, okay, I draw a circuit. Let's say I got a circuit breaker and the contact is broken. So what I have now is a open circuit. Let's say this is where the, the circuit breaker is. It's now an open circuit. And when I have an open circuit, the current can no longer flow. So you'll be, you'll be wondering like, uh, so what, what's up with that? Now, the whole idea is that the open circuit prevents a large current from flowing. And why is a large current bad? Because your appliances can only take a certain uh, maximum amount of current. So if this is your brand new uh, PS, is there a PS5 now? There's a PS5. If there's a brand new PS5 here, you just bought it yesterday and the large current comes in, into your PS5, the PS5 can only take a few amperes, okay? But suddenly let's say there's 20 amperes. This is an insane crazy amount coming into your PS5. It's going to fry your PS5. So we don't want that to happen. We want the current to stop before it goes in to fry your appliances. Okay, have I answered your question, Jaden? Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, great. So now let's look at the actual question itself. Huh? Um, so this is really after, okay? So it's really after the fact that uh, the large current has passed. Uh, so you'll notice that there is now a gap here, right? Okay. Uh, so basically what I was going on and on and on about is the answer here, lah, right? So um, I don't think I'm going to write down everything because I went through and I provided you the, the answer sheet. Uh, so I'm sorry, but what, what are the terminals representing? This terminal and this terminal? Yeah. Okay. So if I go back here, this are the two terminals. So this could be terminal one oh, and I this see. could be terminal two. Right. Okay. Good question. Uh, any other questions? Uh, like I said, the answers tell you uh, what to write. Um, but I thought it, it's better if I actually explain what's happening. And I actually managed to find uh, one or two videos on YouTube with a proper um, illustration or animation to show you how a circuit breaker works. So even after listening to my explanation, you're still not quite sure how it works. Uh, you can go to YouTube and search for those appropriate videos. Okay. Okay, uh, there's a part B. So this shows a rigid wire held between the poles of a magnet. When the current is switched on, there's a force in an upward 
direction. Explain why there is a force acting on it. Okay, so you all know that um, this force is because of the interaction between the magnetic field of the wire and the magnet. Okay, so keyword here, the keyword here is there's an interaction between the magnetic fields of the wire and the magnets. Okay, so this is uh, the keyword here, all right? The interaction between the two magnetic fields. Uh, the next keyword is you have to bring in um, Fleming's left-hand rule, okay? So the wire moves up, is it up, upward, upwards due to Fleming's left hand rule. Okay. Now I know the the answer sheet states uh, about our unbalanced magnetic field and the strength the the direction goes uh, from the stronger magnetic field to the weaker magnetic field and all that. Uh, that one is more of a pure physics answer. Uh, for you guys, all you need to say is that there's an interaction and it moves due to Fleming's left-hand rule. Fleming's left-hand rule explains the stronger magnetic field pushing the, the weaker magnetic field and all that. Okay, So um, this Fleming's so left-hand rule explains all that. Uh, yes, who's asking? Uh, Trisha. Uh, yes, Trish. Is this the standard answer, like the interaction between the magnetic fields of the wire and the magnets for every time they're asking a question on a force acting on a wire? Yes, that is correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Please. Okay, part three. Uh, draw an arrow to show the direction of the current flowing in the rigid wire and label the north pole. Okay. Uh, wait, I'll draw a direction of current flowing. Okay, so the current flows from positive to negative, right? So the current flows here, assuming the switch is closed, the current flows here, and therefore the current flows here. So label it as I, all right? So this is the current flow here. Uh, next, uh, label the direction of the uh, sorry, label the polarity of the, the magnet, right? The horseshoe magnet. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure whether you, you can see me, my, um, my video uh, on top of the screen share, but you are supposed to use Fleming's left-hand rule in order to help you uh, do this. So starting from the thumb is Manchester Football Club, right? So thumb motion, pointing finger feel, and the middle finger current direction. So what I'm gonna do is that, uh, I don't know where the, the, the South Pole is because if you remember, the pointing index finger, you always stick it into the S, right? If you remember that, but there's no S to stick it into now. So I don't know that. So for now, I'm gonna use my thumb and my middle finger first. Okay, so the thumb is pointing upwards, that's the motion. The middle finger is coming towards me, pointing to myself, okay? Because that's the direction of the current. So now my pointing finger is pointing to my right hand side, okay? So if you are following me, it's pointing to the right. So uh, this is my thumb is pointing upwards. My pointing finger is pointing to the right and the current is pointing here. Okay, Ken? 
So this is my motion, my field, and my current here. So I now know that it always points into the S, therefore this is South Pole, this is North Pole. Okay? Got it? Uh, so. Yes, Trish. Uh, for the current, right? Yeah. Is where like the magnetic field for flow, right? Uh, no, current and magnetic field is totally different. Uh, no, 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 the magnetic, uh, sorry, uh, for wrong phrasing, uh, is where like the, wi the wire flows, right? Like the wire is, right? Yes, so the okay. current flows along the wire here. This ah, is okay, the current. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Take that as a no, no one is speaking up. Great. Okay, so um, I've answered all your questions for the Maris paper. Uh, any other questions? No, we are good. Okay, so uh, I believe I'll be seeing you guys one more time next Monday, right? Yep. Okay, yes. so next Monday, I'll be going through the Queensway paper and that will complete this stack of uh, prelim papers, yeah? And then when school reopens, right. uh, I'll, I'll be, hopefully, yeah, hopefully school will reopen, hopefully the COVID situation improves. Yes. Uh, yeah, so when school reopens, uh, I'm going to print another stack of papers for y'all as well as hopefully we can start the lab session too. Okay? Oh my god, yes, finally. The lab, I've been waiting to go to the lab for quite a while, so yeah. <laughs> all this while. <laughs> okay. So uh, okay, so if you do not have any questions, uh, you can just leave this uh, Zoom room. If you do have any questions, you can stay on and ask me. Okay, we got about a, a few more minutes left. All right. So, so if you're right. done, hey, I see the it's gang out. sign. All right. Exactly. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. Bye, okay. Bye, sir. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye, sir. See you. Bye, sir. See you guys. Uh, sir.